Well, good morning and welcome to uh, part two of Discovering Love. So last week we started this series called Discovering Love. And as we started this series, we said love matters most. That this thing called love that we need to make sure that we get right, that we understand it, that we want to, one, be on the receiving end of it, but we have a responsibility to be on the giving end of it too. And so we've looked at this idea of love matters most. And what I shared with you last week is that the best use of life is love. That it's, it's the best use for life. The best thing that we could do with our life is to love other people. That, that we need to let love be our highest goal. That's the highest thing that we would aim for in life. Our highest purpose that we would seek to achieve in using our life to love God and to love people. So this week we're going to talk about worth the love. Worth the love. You know, I, I think that we all have eager people in our lives, that every family tree has some eager people, that, that every office, whether it has it all the time or it's an ebb and flow, every office ends up having some, some eager people. Same thing with our friendship circles. The larger your circle, the more easy you can find eager people. When I'm talking about eager, I'm talking about the E-G-R people. You might know them as extra grace required. These extra grace required people. And, and whenever we say it this way, as soon as I say it for you, you instantly have somebody come to mind. That, that you know exactly who we're talking about when we say extra grace required people. And, 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 and just in case you don't have anybody come to mind, that's not good. Because if nobody comes to mind, then chances are you might be an extra grace required person. Because every one of us, we, we know who those people are in our lives that, that need some extra grace required. And they're still lovable, and we still need to be loving them. See, Jesus loves all of us with extra grace required. I think when it comes to life that there are some people that are hard to love. Some people are almost impossible to love. That they're almost impossible and, and we can think about different scenarios, different situations where it seems like it's really impossible to love them right then and there. Don't know if I can even love them ever. That, that when somebody cuts you off in traffic, that, that, that's hard to love them. When, when, when you sit at the restaurant and you clock in more than 10 minutes before they even take your drink order, <laughs> it's hard to love that waiter or that waitress. It, it's hard to, to show some love. When you're somebody, whether, whether you have to go way back or whether this is current for you, when, when you think about what it's like to be in a classroom environment, and in that classroom environment, and there's that teacher's pet, that if you're not that teacher's pet, it's really hard to love the teacher's pet. It's like, hey, the teacher's giving all the love to them. They don't need any of mine. And we feel that way if I, the whole entire classroom. It's like, well, we don't, we don't want to love them because they're getting enough love from the teacher. We think, that, why, why, would we, why would we love them? It's hard. It's hard to love them when we see that they're getting all of this love. You know, it's hard to love people. People that have wounded us. People that have hurt us. Those are the ones that are they're hard to love when they've given us a, a deep wound. Some of us just need a little scratch from somebody and we're ready to, no more love for you. And we're ready to check out. See, Jesus, Jesus shared with us that we need to love God and we need to love people. In fact, John actually records in John chapter 13, verse 34, John's recording and he's writing down, he's remembering the things that Jesus did and as Jesus was interacting and what Jesus had to say to the disciples. These 12 guys that Jesus was pouring his life into. And he said this, he said, So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. So don't just love each other, but love each other just as I have loved you. Because Jesus came and he modeled perfect love. So we're on a 40 day journey 
And if you're just joining us for the first time today, we're glad you're here. It's not too late to, to jump in. But many of us were here last week as we started this journey of discovering love. Of what's it like? What's it like to be able to discover? What's it like to be loved? And what's it like to discover how we need to be loving? That, that we've got to look at this from both, both sides, both angles, and not just one or the other. And as part of this journey, you need to ask yourself, am I somebody that I naturally seek out some extra grace required people? Or do I seek to avoid them? You got to ask yourself this. That as you're looking at this idea of this discovering love and being on this journey, you've got to ask yourself, am I somebody that I seek out the extra grace required people? Or do I seek to avoid them? Do I see them coming and I just kind of turn? I just try to avoid it. I just like, oh, I forgot that on aisle number seven. Do, do you try to seek them out or are you trying to avoid them? Because we need to be loving people. And when we think of the people that are hardest to love, Jesus loves them. Jesus loves them. And when we look at what kind of love that Jesus has for people, Jesus has a love for people that he accepts people, that he values people, he forgives people, he believes in people. This is what we see when we look at the life of Jesus and what Jesus does with loving others. And so when we ask, worth the love? When we see the people and we go, are they worth the love? The answer is yes. Yes, they're worth the love, and Jesus loves them, and so should we. See, the best example that we have for loving people is Jesus. And he gave this new command, love each other just as I have loved you. We looked last week at something that he gave even a little bit later, but we looked at it last week. Here's the greatest commandment, love God. What's the second? The second greatest commandment is love people. And Jesus said the second is like the first. They're right there. Love God and love people. Not We don't pick, we don't choose. It is both. You won't fully understand how to love other people until you first understand how much God loves you. And we need to understand this. We need to do as much as we can to begin to fathom and grasp and grip and go, this is how much God loves me. And the more that we can understand this, the more that we discover this, then the easier it is for us to be loving other people. So Jesus loves you. And when it comes to Jesus' love and understanding Jesus' love, that Jesus' love, it brings hope what it does the jesus love for us it it brings hope that, that when you're somebody that you feel like well, that, will anybody love me will anybody care for me will anybody accept me see jesus love it brings hope that once we receive that love and and once we have that love in our life that what we get to see is we get to see that that jesus love it actually it builds hope that it builds it. It doesn't just take it and say, hey, here's a little bit of love and good luck to you. It's here's a whole lot of love and it's going to keep on coming and it's going to keep on coming because Jesus love, it actually builds hope. And here's the piece that every single one of us in this room needs to get, that if you're somebody that you have your faith and your hope in Christ, if you, if you choose, chose to bow your knee, bow your heart to Jesus as your Savior, then Jesus love, it should breed hope. That he's given his love to you, and you should be somebody who is actively loving other people. Every people, all people, EGR people, that we should love. That God's love, God's love is as real as it gets. God's love for you is as real as what love gets. And when we receive this love, this real love, then we should give this love and share this love with others. That we have a responsibility as a Christ follower to share this love with others. Maybe, maybe you're here with us today and you're not a Christ follower. You're not a Christian. You're going, 
I, I'm, I'm just here. I'm just trying to find out. Is this something I should do, shouldn't do? Am I missing out on something? Is there something that I need? And maybe for you, maybe it's been a long time since you've even come into a church. And maybe for you, you'd say, you know, Will, the reason why it's so hard for me to even step back into church is because I've been so turned off from Christianity because of Christians. That when I look at people who say that they're Christ followers, that they're a believer, and, and I see them reject me, when I see them not love others, it's just hard. And I'm not sure that I want to be part of something that, that there's a God that loves people, but those people that He loves, that they don't love others. And that it's a struggle for you as you're trying to figure out and trying to decide. Is this something I need? Is this really something for me? Is this something that's really in my best interest? And so I'm glad you're here if that's you and that you're going to be here for you to hear about this discovering love and specifically with today's talk of worth the love. Because the answer is yes, that we're all worth the love. That everyone is worth the love. So I want to look this morning at four ways to love others like Jesus loves you. Four ways to love others like Jesus loves you. So we're going to look very specifically at how does Jesus love me? Okay, then that's how I need to love others. So because Jesus accepts me, I will accept others. This is one of the ways. Because Jesus accepts me, I will accept others. I think that the deepest emotional wounds the, the, the biggest scars that we carry. I, I think for us, the, the things that we look at in our life of, of where we grieve the most, where we're trying the hardest to try to overcome, I think the most painful experiences that we experience in life are the experiences where we are rejected. It causes the greatest grief for any one of us when we feel rejected. When we feel like we're not good enough, we're not, we're not somebody that, that matters and that we get rejection. And whether that rejection is something as simple and light as just being belittled or whether it's as heavy as betrayal, rejection is painful. And because people reject us, we begin to question in and of ourselves, am I a life that matters? Am I someone that matters? Do I have any worth? And we struggle with this because of the rejection that we've faced before. It causes us to even question Will Jesus even accept us? Because we look at how people are rejecting us and going, wow, they see us and, and they're imperfect and they reject us. Will a perfect God accept me? And this is very important for us to understand. See, we all experience rejection. Every single one of us experiences, experiences rejection on, on different levels and at different times. We know what it's like to, to have that pain of rejection. Some people, some people completely give up on life because of the rejection that they've experienced. So some people just become a recluse and go, it's just not worth it. It's not worth the risk of being rejected again. And rejection comes from places and times that, that it should never even come in. So there's times when when, when, when some people are actually rejected by their parents. One of the most sacred relationships that should be there. And yet they get rejected in that relationship. That you could be someone that, that you've been rejected by a former spouse. And you could be remarried. And you could even be enjoying and being fulfilled in that marriage. But you still deal with the heart of being rejected someone who's rejected you because rejection is painful and everyone experiences it 
we have an unwritten understanding in life. And that is be accepted and avoid rejection. It's this unwritten understanding, and it's like at all costs, avoid rejection and make sure that you are accepted. Some of us, we've made our most destructive choices just trying to be accepted. That the things that we've done, that we have our biggest regrets over, are the things that we did just trying to be accepted by people, accepted by others doing whatever we could to avoid being rejected. And we do it in all sorts of forms and fashions. So some people, they're, they're, it's the clothes that they wear, that they wear those clothes so that they can just be accepted. Just so that it won't have to feel rejected. That maybe it's the, it's the car and it's, I've got to drive this so that I can feel accepted by others. Maybe, maybe it's even the career that you end up finding yourself in. And it's a job and a career that you hate. But you do it to be accepted, to avoid rejection. Because we have this unwritten understanding of whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes to feel accepted, to avoid the rejection. And we'll do things on the weekends that we have no business doing that we'll end up adopting a language and the way that we speak in a way that, 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 that crushes us on the inside, but we're doing it anyways because whatever it takes to avoid rejection, we'll do it. It's how heavy it is that everything in your life, it's touched in some form, some fashion, some way with this fear, this fear that says, I don't want to be rejected. What do I have to do? to avoid rejection? What do I have to do to be accepted by others? And I think it's easy for us to even begin to think, if I were just perfect, if I could just be perfect then, then everybody would accept me that I want to accept me. Then everybody would love me that I want to love me. Then, then nobody, nobody would reject, everybody would accept, and I would just be able to feel the love. And it's easy for us to believe that. And so then we start getting on this perfection kick and trying to do everything we can to be perfect in everything that we do. But I've got news for you. Even if we could become perfect, we would still be rejected. We would still have people that would not accept us. And the reason I know this and I can say this confidently is because Jesus was perfect. And yet he was rejected. Jesus was perfect. And people were not accepting him. Even the religious people were not accepting him. And he was perfect. So it's not our perfection that's going to allow us to be accepted. And Jesus, Jesus knows what it's like to be rejected. He's experienced it. And he compassionately accepts us. In Romans, the Apostle Paul is the one who wrote this book. And in Romans 15, 7, Paul is teaching and exhorting us. And he says, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you so that God will be given glory. That, that when we accept each other, God gets glorified. He gets all of the glory and all of the praise because of how we accept each other. That this is what we should do just as Jesus has accepted us. I don't know if you realize this or not, but Jesus accepts you. He accepts you and he accepts you just the way you are. He doesn't want to leave you the way you are. He doesn't want to leave me the way that I am. But he accepts me the way that I am. Just the way I am, he loves me. Just the way you are, he loves you. He accepts you. Maybe you've heard somebody ask, have you accepted Jesus? 
and we make it sometimes about what we do to him and we need to accept him. But we need to understand that he accepts us. So we need to accept others. So another way to love others like Jesus loves you is because Jesus values me. I will value others. You see, Jesus doesn't just accept us. He values us. Jesus was teaching one day and Luke, who was a medical doctor, he was not one of the 12 disciples. He discovered who Jesus is and, and he wanted to write about the life and times of Jesus and he interviewed everybody that he could get his hands on to find out about Jesus and to record his activity. And so Luke writes and he shares this in Luke chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. Jesus said, What is the price of five sparrows? Two copper coins? In other words, sparrows were cheap. Yet God does not forget a single one of them. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. You know how we determine value? We determine value in one simple way. What is someone willing to pay? It's that simple. What's the value of something? The value is determined by what someone is willing to pay. And if you, if you wrestle with feeling valuable, do I matter? Am I valuable to God? Then you need to ask, you need to ask yourself, am I willing to look at the evidence to see how valuable I am to God? Because here's the evidence. The evidence is that Jesus stretched out his arms and hung on a cross to say, I love you this much. That's your value. The value that God has on you is the value where he said, I'm going to send my one and only son for you. That is how much I value you. And because Jesus values me, then I will value others. It's what we need to do. Another way to love others like Jesus loves you is because Jesus forgives me, I will forgive others. See, we thought that acceptance part was hard. This forgive can be hard. You know, some people think that God carries a grudge. You ever, have you ever thought to yourself or even said out loud, when, when, when all of a sudden life gets really tough and hard and difficult and things aren't going well, and, and, and you either think or you say, yeah, God's, God's getting even with me. God's getting even with me because of what I did three hours ago. In three days, or weeks, months, years, or decades. And we get convinced God's got a score, scorecard out and he's waiting for just the right time to pounce on us, to get even with us. See, we think, oh, God, God just has this grudge and he's just holding against us. But here's something that, that Luke also recorded about Jesus and Jesus showing forgiveness. It's found in Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36. It says, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and he sat down to eat. And when a certain immoral woman from that city heard that he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. And when the Pharisee, who had invited Jesus, saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, 
he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Now, if Jesus says, I have something to say to you, it's probably not going to be good for you. So Jesus says, I've got something to say to you. And Jesus is going to really help him see something that he's been completely blind to. It says, then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. And who do you suppose loved him more after that? I mean, we're even bright. We don't have to be a Pharisee to figure that one out, do we? It's the one that, that forgave and had 50 pieces, 500 pieces forgiven, not the one with the 50. And Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and he said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss from the time that I first came in, and she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. And look at this. Jesus said, I tell you, her sins, and look at this part, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who's forgiven little shows only a little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. And the men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. See, there's an incredible amount of peace that comes when there's heartfelt forgiveness. There's peace that the only way that we will ever get that again is when we feel forgiven. And because Jesus has forgiven me, I will forgive others. This is part of our journey of discovering love. That because Jesus has forgiven me, I will forgive others. And the last one is because Jesus believes in me, I will believe in others. Because Jesus believes in me, I will believe in others. Did you know that there's people all around you that have low self-esteem? Yeah, even in church here today, or as you go to school, as you go to work, Wherever you go, there's people all around you that are surrounded. They're surrounding you and they have low self-esteem. So we all have insecurities. There's not a single one of us that are exempt from having insecurities. We all have insecurities. We deal with them differently, but we all have them. It's almost like a curse when people say, you're not going to amount to anything. You'll never become anything. It's like a curse. And that curse for some, they, they feel like, well, that's all I have to, to live up to. And, and how do you reverse that curse? How do you back off away from that? And how, how do you start believing what Jesus has to say? When Jesus believes in you. How can we start believing that when we don't even have people in our lives? that believe in us and that we don't see that and we don't experience this. Simon Peter was one of the 12 disciples. And when Jesus gave his life and he got on that cross, 
11 of the 12 disciples, they, they fled. So John's the only disciple that we know of that was at the feet of Jesus when Jesus was giving his life on the cross. One disciple, Judas Iscariot, went and hung himself because he knew that he had betrayed Jesus. Peter, who said, I'll, I'll never deny you. When Jesus warned him, Peter, you're going you're gonna to deny me three times before the rooster crows. No, Jesus, I'll never deny you. He ends up denying him three different times. Hey, aren't, aren't you that guy that was hanging out with Jesus? Aren't you one of his followers? No, no, I, I don't know who you're talking about. Hey, there's, there's one of his disciples right there. Not who, me? What? I don't know what you're talking about. Three different times he denied. And what we get to see, what happens with the disciples, that after Jesus gives his life on the cross, they all just went back to doing the same thing that they did before. Several of the disciples were fishermen. Jesus went and hung out at the shore where they, he knew they would be fishing. And when Peter saw him, Peter jumped out of the boat. He swam to the shore to go be right there with Jesus because when Jesus rose again, he appeared on earth for 40 days. And at one of these interactions is this time when Peter comes over and sees Jesus. And Jesus had a question for him. And Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, I love you. And Jesus said, well, go feed my sheep. He wasn't talking about these little bah, lambs. He was talking about people. People that would believe and trust in Jesus. Go feed my sheep. So after he asked him that question, he had another question for him. So he asked him this. Peter, do you love me? And Peter responded, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Jesus said, then go feed my sheep. Jesus had one more question for Peter that day. And that question was, Peter, do you love me? And Peter looked at Jesus and he said, Jesus, you know. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, go feed my sheep. So there was three times that Peter denied knowing Jesus. And Jesus knew. So Jesus wanted Peter to know how much he believed in him. So he gave him three times to let him know. I believe in you. I believe that you love me. And I want to trust you with the responsibility to go feed my sheep. I believe in you. See, it wasn't the first time that Peter or any of the disciples would understand that Jesus believes in them. Because Jesus had said it before in John chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. John records Jesus saying, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works. Because I'm going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. See what Jesus was letting them know that day. I believe in you. And you need to know that my belief in you is I believe in you and you're going to be able to do greater things than even what I've done. That's belief. And Jesus wants you to believe in other people too. That Jesus believes in you. And when you grasp that, when you experience that, he wants you to take the responsibility of believing in others too. And expressing it. And letting them know. What we need to do this week is we, is we seek to love others. Is we need to accept them. We need to value them. We need to forgive them and we need to believe in them. That if you've come to understand how Jesus has accepted and valued and forgiven and believed in you, then you have the responsibility.
to be that to others. But maybe you're here and you're going, I, well, this is, this is something that's beginning to make sense to me for the very first time. That Jesus, the Son of God, that he accepts me. That I don't have to perform for him, that he just accepts me. That he values me. Even when he looks at all the things that I've done. And that he'll forgive me. That Jesus believes in me. Maybe this is beginning to make sense to you for the very first time. And maybe today means to be the day that for you, you discover his love for the very first time. Would you bow your heads with me? If you're somebody this morning that for you and you think about discovering love for the very first time, you're really starting to see the light and you're discovering this kind of love. A love from your heavenly father is sending his son because he accepts you. He values you because he forgives you and he believes in you. If you want to take hold of all of that, if that's you, and you're ready today to put your faith and your hope and your trust in Jesus for the very first time, would you just make eye contact with me, slip your hand up and go, Will, that's me. Today's my day to discover his love for me. Is there anyone here today that's making that kind of discovery? I see you. I see you. I see you. Is there anybody else today that's going to discover that love for the very first time? I see you. If this is you and you're saying, I'm ready to discover this love, I want to know this love. Then I want to lead you in a prayer. A prayer that you would be praying to your Heavenly Father. Expressing to Him your acceptance of His offer to love you. Pray this with me silently right where you are. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Those words can't begin to express my real gratitude. But I am so grateful that you choose to love me, to accept me, to value me, to forgive me. And I confess to you, I've sinned. I've failed. I've not lived up to what your plan is for my life. I confess that. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for believing in me. Believing in me enough to value me. Jesus, today I put my faith, and my hope, and my trust in you to be my Savior so that I can have a right relationship with my Heavenly Father. Jesus, it's in your name I pray and I'm grateful. Amen. And if that's you, we celebrate that and we say, welcome to the family of God. If that's you, there's, there's two things I'd, I'd like to extend an invitation to you for. One is that you would just go stop by our Welcome Center and let them know that this is you and you made this decision today. That today you said, hey, I discovered God's love today. Because we have a gift that we'd love to give you that's going to help you on your faith journey. Help you as you begin to discover more and more about God's love for you. The second thing that I'd encourage you to do is as you stop by that Welcome Center, to just express, hey, there was that baptism thing I saw this service. And, and I want to find out more about that and what that is and what that means and whether I should do that or not. And I know that, that Corey, one of our pastors, is going to be there. That You could talk to him and find out more about that. Whether you're somebody that you've made a decision today or whether you're somebody that you've just never been baptized since you made the decision to put your faith and your hope and trust in Jesus. Either way, stop by, see Corey. He'd love to talk to you guys about that. You guys have a great week, and we're going to talk next week more about discovering love.